All right, take your Bible this evening and turn with me to the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter number 6. 1 Corinthians, chapter number 6. It's great to be in church on a Thursday night. I think the only thing better than church on Sunday is more of it during the week. And I'm excited to be here tonight. I've heard great reports from the meeting thus far. And uh, my wife and others have let me know there's been a great spirit here. The messages have been right on target. And it's been a good time. And I'm excited about that. I believe God is still interested in doing something now. I believe God wants to work in our lives now. I don't believe uh, we serve the God that did, but I believe we serve the God that still does. And uh, I think God is very interested in working in this generation. I'm excited about it. He's not tired. He's not taking a break. He's not in a lazy boy somewhere. He's on the throne. And if God ever did anything, He can still do everything. And I'm excited about the prospects of, of this generation. And God wants to do something for us. Thank you, preacher, for allowing me to come and for uh, Dr. Jordanson and the college for hosting this conference. It's a great thing, isn't it? There's a lot of reasons why I like this conference. I thought about this at the house before I came. I like this conference, number one, because of where it is. I like it because of this place. There's not a whole lot of places like this place, but I'm glad this place is like this place. Amen. I like it because of where it is. Not only that, I like it because of what it's about. Young Fundamentalist Conference. You don't have to wonder what we're talking about. I like that. Not only that, I like it because of why folks come. Now, we do have boxing. That's pretty interesting. We get to, we get to suck down a bunch of Reese eggs, and that's a blessing. But uh, I think most folks come for the preaching, and uh, that's the way it ought to be. I like it because of that. And most of all, I like it because we get to hit each other. And uh, anyway... But anyhow, all right, let's stand our feet if you would, and uh, we'll get right in the message this evening. And this is the good place to be. I heard a story of a fellow. He was driving down the road, and he had a big truck full of something, and it had an aroma to it. Kind of like that fellow who just got done boxing next to you right now does, right? Uh, it had an aroma to it, and he was driving slowly down an old country road, and a boy hollered at him. I like the word holler. That's something you can do or a place you can visit, either one. Uh, but he, he hollered at him, and he said, sir, what's in the truck? He said, I got fertilizer in there. He'd been to the farm. And he said, where are you going to do that fertilizer? He said, I'm going to take it home and put it on my strawberries. That fellow said, man, it must be rough at your house. He said, we got a lot better at our place. We put sugar on our strawberries. Uh, but this is a good place to be. I, there's a lot of places you can go and get fertilizer, but I like to come here and get some, get some good stuff. Say amen right there. I'm looking forward to hearing our preacher preach in just a moment. It's good to have folks from all over the country here. And some of my dear friends are here, and I appreciate that. I love preachers. B.R. Lakin said that preachers are like bananas. He said, if you leave the bunch, one of them is going to peel you. And so I found it is good to be good to preachers. And thank you, preachers, for investing in the lives of your young people. First Corinthians chapter 6, let's read verse number 9 down to verse number 11. And you'll notice that my suit coat won't be buttoned while I preach. That's because when Brother Joel walked off, he shook my hand, and he ripped the button, and there it lays, off my suit coat. Now, I'm not bitter about it at all, but I am mad. All right? All right. He said put it on uh, the college's tab, so we'll talk about that later. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter number 6, I would say they'll take, add it to my love offering, but, you know. All right. When you, li when you live close by, but anyway. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, let's read verse number 9 down to verse number 12. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, you say that now. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. There's a lot of things I like about my Bible, but one thing especially I love about the Word of God is the Bible never leaves man without hope. No matter how dark the scene or how bad the situation, God always lets a bright light shine through. If you and I read verse 9 and 10 and we read those two verses honestly, we could read those two verses and we could find ourselves there. Now, necessarily, it might not be that you've committed one of these sins per se specifically, but verse 9 and 10 describes mankind. It describes sinners. And if we'd be honest with ourselves, all of us fit in those two verses because that's what you are and that's what I am. I'm a sinner. But I'm glad God let some hope come through, and He gave, gave us a verse 11. He didn't leave us in verse 9 and 10, but I'm glad He pinned a verse 11. In verse 9 and 10, God condemns these people through Paul's writing. But in verse 11, we find a testimony of what they are now since they're saved. And He says, And such were, past tense, not anymore, used to be, such were some of you, but you are washed, you are sanctified, and you are justified. 
I began to study these verses and I read verse 9 and 10 and thought about the sins that man commits and thought about my own life and, and the amazing grace of God that's been bestowed upon me. And I began to ask myself the question, why would God save me? Why would God want me? Why would God love me or have me? Why would God let me leave verse 9 and 10 and jump into verse 11? I saw the word you and I began to think, why would God save a sinner like me? But then I began to ask myself, why would God save an old sinner like you? For just a few minutes this evening, I want to preach and then I'll get out of the way. But I want you to think with me on this, with me on this thought. Why would God save an old sinner like you? Everybody is looking for purpose. So let me butt in on some other's territory and give you some Bible purpose this evening. Let's pray and we'll get in the message. Lord, thank you for the privilege to be in church tonight. God, this has been a good place to be. Thank you for the sweet spirit of these uh, young men and young ladies that have come from all over the place. And, and Lord, they, they've come to a meeting that's called a Young Fundamentalist Meeting. God, their heart, no doubt, is set to do right, and they're striving to serve you. And, God, I pray that you'd use them in a great and mighty way. God, I pray tonight for the preaching. I pray that you'd use uh, the preacher and use myself as we stand. I pray for power. Lord, I understand there's hearts here that are hungry to hear from heaven. And, God, I can't drive truth into their hearts, but you can by your Spirit. So I pray that you just push me aside and preach me in spite of myself. I pray, Lord, you'd send the power just now. And I pray you do something of eternal value in somebody's heart. Give us a spirit of liberty, a touch of revival. In all things, I pray you'd have the preeminence. Call preachers from this meeting, and evangelists, missionaries, faithful Christians, soul winners. If there's one lost, I pray they be saved. It's in the name of our blood-stained Redeemer, I pray. In the name of Jesus, amen. You can be seated. I've got no misconceptions when it comes to what manner of man I really am. Without hesitation, I can tell you tonight that Justin Cooper is a sinner. But before you shake your head at me and get carpet burned on your chin, let me see on the heels of that neighbor, you're a sinner too. The rapture of the entire human race is summed up by the statement we find in Romans 3.23 where the Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Humanity is conceived in iniquity. We've been condemned by iniquity and consistent in iniquity. At the very moment Adam's tongue became the landing pad for the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden, mankind was plunged into the horrible hell-bound vein of sin. Our title became transgressor. Our verdict rang out guilty. Our sentence became death and our condition hopelessness all because of sin. But in fashion that can only be described as amazing grace, God crafted a door framed by the gospel of Christ so that even the most wretched sinner who's teetering on the very edge of hell can step across that threshold and then shout and say, My name once stood with sinners lost and bore a painful record, but by His blood the Savior crossed and placed it on His roll. I'm saved to the uttermost, and I know that I am washed in the blood of the precious Lamb, knowing the depths of depravity that we've been driven down to, comprehending the crimes against heaven that we're all guilty of, realizing the righteousness of God. I believe the question that billows in our mind and begs to be answered in our heart this evening is why would God save some old sinner like me? But why would God save some old sinner like you? Here in 1 Corinthians 6, the Bible sets us down amidst an ongoing counseling session between the Apostle Paul and the carnal church in Corinth. Now, if you study out the book of Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, it does not find uh, take long to find that there was a lack of character in this local church. I would say that if you went to uh, Corinth and you walked into the local assembly there, you'd find the fireplace of revival held nothing but cold gray ashes. I'd say the showers of blessings had receded into the mud holes of melancholy. I'd say that the old-fashioned altar was emptied and all but iced over because where the flesh prevails, the spiritual temperature is always going to drop. If you study out the book of Corinthians, you'll find this was a carnal church. It was a worldly church. It was a puffed-up church. It was a prideful church. It was probably a Baptist church. I'd say that if you walked in the first Baptist church on any given Sunday morning, you'd find the preacher was Dr. Flesh. I'd say Brother Old Nature was the song leader. Probably Mr. Uh, Old Levin was the Sunday school superintendent. Miss Natural Mind probably played the piano. And I'd say the devil probably ran the sound system because the devil always gets in the sound system. But mark it down, neighbor. If you want the fire of God to burn at your church, the fire of God to burn in your life, the fire of God to be evident on your walk with God, you cannot be carnal. You must be clean. God wants you and I to live holy, even as, as He is holy. And if the flesh prevails, 
fails, the spiritual temperature is not going to be very high. Here in verse number 11, Paul is charging the Corinthians to clothe their Christian lives in consistent holiness. And it gives us a testimony of these believers, including what they were before they got saved and now where they stand since they've been saved. Look with me at verse 11. The Bible said and such, were some of you, but you're washed, but you're sanctified, but you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Paul is buckling these Christians into the proverbial passenger seat and he's driving them back down memory's lane and he lists some ten terrible sins and then he says it's those same sins, those same transgressions, those same iniquities that had dug the very pit of hell that God had once pulled you out of. In essence, he's saying there was a time you were swine and now you're sheep. There was a time you were lost and now you're found. There was a day you were broken and now you're made whole. There was a day you were unclean and now you're clean. There was a day you were wrong with God and now you're right with God. There was a day you were headed to hell on a greased rail and now you're heaven bound with the hammer down. There was a day when you were children of the devil, but now you're children of the king. You're such were some of you reaching down to the darkest corner of the devil's dungeon. God's long arm of grace had pulled the Corinthians up from a horrible pit, had washed them in the blood of the Lamb, had birthed them in the family of God, and prepared them a place up in heaven. I'd say these ones condemned sinners must have shouted amen. I'd say they sung hallelujah. I'd say they whispered glory and wiped tears of joy from their eyes as they read that past tense phrase from the Apostle Paul, and such were, and such used to be, not any longer. Such were some of you. Every single week I travel and I preach to crowds just like this. And these churches I preach in are filled with people that can all be described by the terrible sins we find in verse 9 and 10. But now our collective testimony is verse 11. And such were some of you. Now I hear what you're saying tonight, Brother Cooper. You go places like that and preach to people like those. Newsflash neighbor, I'm in that place and preaching to those people here this evening. If we'd be honest and not good old-fashioned Baptists, we'd read verse 9 and 10 and say, Oh God, there am I. I mean, maybe even in the service this evening, there's some who could say, you know what? I used to be a fornicator, but now I'm washed. Now I'm sanctified. Now I'm justified. I used to be a gossip or a liar, but now I'm washed. Now I'm sanctified. Now I'm justified. I used to be a drunkard, but now I'm washed. Now I'm sanctified. Now I'm justified. I used to be effeminate. Huh. I'm still worried about some of you fellas. It's okay to get dirty, burp and scratch every once in a while. Fellas, it's okay to act like a man and watch football. I worry about these fellas with pink neckties on. Or short neckties on. What in the world's up with that? Uh, it's okay to go ahead and act like a man. Let your girlfriend handle the feminine side of things. Say amen right there. I won't tell anybody you said it. Amen. But now I'm washed and now I'm sanctified and now I'm justified. Oh, bless the name of Jesus. There was a time in my life when I was lost and undone. I was sinking down deep in a pit of depravity. I was headed to hell, deserved to be there. The wrath of God abided upon my life. I was sinking down to rise no more. But one day grace mixed with mercy came by in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and He reached a nail's card hand down to me and He pulled me from my pit, set my feet on a rock, and establish my goings. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. But it saved a wretch like you too. I'm convinced this evening if we stop just for a moment and we comprehend our continual sinning and running from the will of God and then realize the high price that God has paid for our sin, I believe our astonishment will lead us to ask the question this evening, why would God have me? Why would God want me? Why would God love me? Why would God save me? Why would would he save an old sinner like me? And why would he save some old sinner like you? I heard a story about George Whitfield. He was preaching in London in his tabernacle. As George Whitfield was on the inside of that church house, he was screaming one phrase, screaming because that's what preaching is. He was screaming one phrase out over and over while he preached. He was crying at the top of his ability. God takes the devil's castaways. Over and over the preacher cried, God takes the devil's castaways. The preacher didn't know it. But on the stoop of the church said a couple of ladies that were living a sinful lifestyle. They were ladies of the night, ladies of the world, and they were recovering from a night of sin. As the preacher cried on the inside, they sat on the outside. They heard the preacher's echo come through the door. God 
God takes, the devil's cast away. One looked at the other and said, did you hear that? The other said, I did, but he can't mean us. He doesn't know what we are. He doesn't know what we've done. He doesn't know where we've been. And again, the preacher cried, God takes, the devil's cast away. A tear ran down the dirt-stained face of one of those ladies. And she said, if anybody's a castaway of the devil, we must be castaways of the devil. The other said, then why sit we here any longer? And those two daughters of the devil stood up. They opened the back doors of the house of God. They came walking down the middle aisle and bowed in an old-fashioned altar. And that day, two daughters of hell became set for heaven because they heard God take the devil's castaways. Tonight, I'm preaching to a crowd of young folks. We look real good on the outside, but get down to it. We were all castaways of the devil. The world had us by the tail. The devil had us by the throat. We were lost and undone without God or His Son. But one day, we heard God takes the devil's castaways. But my question tonight is this. Why? I mean, I'm unholy and God's holy. Why? I'm unrighteous and God is righteous. Why? I'm depraved and God's divine. Why? I'm pure hate and God's pure love. Why? I'm full of error and God is flawless. Why? I'm temporal and God's eternal. Why? Why would He love me? Why would He have me? Why would He save me? And when in heavenly glory my ransomed soul shall be free from sin and all pollution forever and ever free, I'll cast my crown before Him and let out His grace extol. Thou hast redeemed me, yes. Thou hast done it all. Jesus paid it all. All to Him I owe. My sin had left a crimson stain, but He washed it white as snow. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure that He would give His only Son to make this wretch His treasure. It shocks me that God would save some old drunk like Noah, but I can't believe He'd save you. It blows my mind He'd save some harlot like the Samaritan woman, but I can't believe He'd save you. I can't believe he'd call Lazarus out of the tomb, but I'm kind of shocked he'd save me as well. You see, some call him just the Redeemer, but I can call him Savior. They might call him the Lily of the Valley, but I just call him Savior. They can call him the Rose of Sharon, but I like to call him my Savior. They can call him the Lion of the tribe of Judah. I like to call him my Savior. They might call him the Ancient of Days. I just like to call him my Savior. They might call him the Omnipotent One, but I like to call him my Savior. They might call him the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, but but this old sinner gets to call him my Savior. Yes, I'm a sinner, but I'm a sinner saved. I'm a sinner redeemed. I'm a sinner born again. I'm a sinner right with God. I'm a sinner headed to heaven where we'll never die in the presence of God as the ages roll. But why? You ever wonder that? You ever wonder why it is God would save somebody like you and save somebody like me? As I travel around the world, I'm noticing that people are looking for purpose. They're looking for purpose in all the wrong places. I found the best book to find purpose in is this book right here. So quickly tonight, let me give you a couple things and I'll be through. Why I believe God saved you and why I believe God saved me. God did not just save you to sit and sour and sulk till the rapture. You've got a purpose. You've got a reason. You've got a cause this evening. Some of you ought to preach on that this week. Where's Brother Davis anyhow? Uh, let me give you three reasons I believe God saved a sinner like you and a sinner like me. Number one, I believe God saved you and God saved me to fight. Now, if I get too deep on y'all, you just yell at me and I'll throw you a lifeline, okay? Jude 3, beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. I want you to hear this statement. If you and I don't fight for our faith today, there will be no faith worth fighting for tomorrow. Here is Jude puts the ball in motion in this epistle to early believers. He gets right to the point of his message. The crux of this message is the battling of apostasy. Even in the first century, bad doctrine and false teachers were infiltrating the ranks of the church. And to offset this, Jude calls on the Christians to earnestly contend for the faith. Now, in that phrase, earnestly contend, it carries the idea of a soldier who's warring in the very heat of battle. Now, please notice, Jude does not say you need to contend over the color of carpet in the church. He doesn't say fight over who gets the front seat in the van on the way home from youth conference. Amen. He doesn't say you need to fight over it if you go to McDonald's or Burger King and how many Whoppers you get to eat. 
right? He didn't say you fight over the ply of, uh, of toilet tissue out there in the vestibule. He said you got to fight, you got to contend, you got to battle for the eternal truths, the doctrine contained in this book right here. Every born again child of God, it is your job and mine. Whenever the devil begins to blast away at any part of this book, it is our job to unsheathe our sword, raise up a standard, a sound the trumpet, and fight for our faith. I love my nation. I am not one of these flag burning, constitution denying, sit down during the national anthem type Americans. I love my country, but we enjoy a blessed nation because our blessings were procured on the battlefield. Somebody shed their blood so you can enjoy the America that you have this evening. But just as we have enjoyed a blessed history uh, in our country, we have a blessed history of the faith because likewise it's been purchased, paid for, and bought on the battlefield. You ever wonder why you have a King James Bible tonight? It's because somebody else fought for it. You ever wonder why it is you're in a church like this tonight? Because somebody else fought for it. You ever wonder why it is you sing the hymns of the faith? It's because somebody stood for the faith and they fought for it. Fight for the faith. God does not use some cowardly, gingerly, backwards, amen, panty waist, limp wristed, blushing, backwards type Christian to make a mark in the world. He uses a Christian with backbone, with character, and when he'll stand against the drift of his day and fight for the faith. Stephen was stoned to death, but he still fought for his faith. Paul had his head cut off, but he still fought for his faith. Peter was crucified upside down, but he still fought for his faith. John was boiled and then exiled, but he still fought for the faith. John Bunyan was in prison and his daughter came and said, Daddy, they said they'll let you out of prison if you just won't preach anymore. And he said, well, honey, he said, if they let me out of prison today, I'll be downtown preaching Jesus tomorrow. He wasn't going to back up or bend. He fought for his faith. John Wesley was in his, uh, his daddy's home church. His daddy was dead and buried in the graveyard out behind the church. He preached a message the folks didn't like. And they ran him out of the church. Instead of tucking his tail and running, he went out to that graveyard, climbed up on his daddy's tombstone, preached from the top of that grave marker, and went ahead and finished his message. And he fought for his faith. Listen, I don't fight for a man. I don't fight for a movement. I don't fight for an ideal. I fight for the faith. I fight for the faith this book contains. I fight for the faith that God ordained. I fight for the faith that Jesus taught and the disciples propagated around the world. I don't fight for my preference. I fight for the precepts and principles of a thrice holy God. And God wants you not to fight for our faith. No soldier's worth the salt in his bread. If he'll eat, can't shall. Wear the army uniform and even uh, sleep in the barracks, but won't ever fire his gun or man the front lines. Shame on you if you'll come to a conference and shout her out, but you won't stand for the faith in your school. You won't stand for the faith at your workplace. You won't stand for your faith with your friends. We're not going to make a difference being cowards. We're going to have to take charge and stand. It's time tonight somebody says, you know what? I'm going to grab a Bible. I'm going to get some boldness. I'm going to grow a backbone and get a fire burning deep in my soul. And I'm going to yell at the devil and say, ring the bell. Let's start the first round. You can be a coward and run if you want to, but I'm going to be a contender and I'll stand and fight for the faith. God always blesses a battle-ready believer, whether it's Moses with a staff or David with a sling or Samson with the jawbone of a deacon. Say amen right there. God always blesses a battle-hardened, battle-ready believer. You and I ought to fight. We don't fight flippantly. We don't fight just because we want to fight, but you can't be for something unless you're against something. Now listen, I don't choose my enemies. This Bible chooses them for me. I don't just contend with somebody because I don't like the way they knot their, their necktie. But if they go against the Bible, I can't be for them. You say, what do you mean? I mean, if somebody says that my Lord wasn't born of a virgin, they're my enemy. And I ought to fight. If somebody says my Bible's not the inspired Word of God, they're my enemy. And I ought to fight. If somebody said that Christ died for some and not for the world, that's my enemy. And poor theologian at that. And, and out of fight. If somebody says that dress standards don't matter and God says, be a hip and not be holy, that's my enemy and out of fight. If somebody says we can bring worldly music into our services and we can uh, rock out for the rock, that's my enemy. And I ought to fight. If somebody says that Sunday school's outdated, that's my enemy. And I ought to fight. I ought to fight with my faith and fight with my testimony and fight with my holiness and fight with my separation and fight with my character and fight with my prayer life. I don't necessarily fight with my fist, but I do fight with my stand. And tonight we need a group of young folks who will resolve and say, I don't care what the crowd does. I don't care what my neighbors think. I don't care what the populace says. I'm going to stand for that book. I'm going to stand for the faith and I'll fight for it in my generation. You can't sing. You can't sing I'll Fly Away unless you sing Keep on the Firing Line. 
You can't sing Sweet Hour of Prayer unless you sing When the Battle's Over, We Shall Wear a Crown. Amen. You can't, you can't sing What a Friend We Have in Jesus without echoing back a victory in Jesus as well. Lester Roll said, it's a battlefield, brother, not a recreation room. Paul said, war, a good warfare, fight a good fight, put on the whole armor of God. Ecclesiastes said, there's no discharge from this war. I can't build bridges when the walls are falling down. I've got to fight. I can't just simply carry a trowel and leave my sword at the house. You've got to fight. I can't just toot a Christian kazoo and never blow my trumpet. I've got to stand for the faith and fight. If you and I don't fight for our faith today, there'll be nothing to fight for tomorrow. You need to resolve tonight you're going to be like Abraham and fight for your family. Be like David and fight for your brethren. Be like Elijah and fight uh, for the truth. Be like Daniel and fight against the persecution of culture. And be like Peter and fight against the religious uh, crowd of your day. And be like Paul and fight against apostasy. But stand and fight for your faith. Number one, God saved you to fight. Number two, God saved you to fish. Matthew, not that kind of fishing, sir. Matthew 4, 19. The Bible said, and he saith unto them, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. God saved you and I not just to fight, but he saved us to fish. The Bible says in Matthew 4, 19 that we're to be fishers of men. Fresh from his wilderness season with the devil, Jesus walks by the seashore. And he sees a couple of men there tending to their nets and working with their boats. And he tells them to leave their nets and forget the boats and to follow him and be fishers of men. Christ's first command to those men is our lifelong commission. We are to pull men, women, boys, and girls out of the lake of fire and set their feet on the rock of ages. The very first step that a new convert takes away from an altar ought to be their first step toward being a soul winner. You don't have to take a seminar and then go soul winning. You don't have to go through a 10-step program to be a soul winner. All you've got to know is what God did for you and tell somebody else, and that's enough for God to do it to the, for them. I bet you there's a handful of folks in here tonight that are waiting on the will of God. Did you know the waiting on the will of God can end up being a sinful thing because we use it to put off the will of God? Can I help you? Don't pine after God's perfect will. Just do His plain will. You said, I'd really like to know what God's will for my life is. I got it. It's not real deep, but it'll help you. Go win a sinner to Jesus. Amen. Soul winning is the heartbeat of God. It's the, it's the program of the local church. It's the nearest thing to the heart of our Savior. Soul, a Christian who's not a soul winner is like a barber that won't cut hair. Amen. A Christian who's not a soul winner is like a skunk that don't stink. Say amen right there. A Christian who's not a soul winner is like a fish out of water or a sheep out of the fold or a, a dog that won't bark or a cat, period. Just a cat. Amen. I try to stay in the Bible. A lady in Maryland said, Brother Cooper, I know you have a little puppy, and I do. I have a little Yorkie dog. And you say, that's kind of feminine. You try, she'll, she'll, she'll bite the skin off your ankle if you say that in her presence. But anyway, uh, she said, I know you have a little puppy. I want to ask you something. My dog died. You reckon my dog went to heaven? I didn't want to hurt her feelings and tell her no. I saved that for the sermon, right? I said, uh, I said I'm, not, I'm not sure. I'll have to study it and get back to you. She said, what about my cat? My cat died. I said, no, your cat's in hell. But... Uh, Everybody okay? <laughs> Pass that lady a tissue. She's having a hard time. <laughs> contend, ma'am, contend. Friskies is right out of hell. Amen. Anyway, uh, God wants you not to be soul winners. The Bible tells us that a soul winner is wise. A soul winner is joyful. A soul winner gets a crown. A soul winner is shining. A soul winner is like a shepherd that brings in lost sheep or a, or, or a farmer with holes in his seed bag or a fisherman whose net's about to bust. Now, listen, all my heroes are soul winners. I don't read after nor follow anybody that's not a soul winner or was not a soul winner. All of my heroes, Dr. Rice was a soul winner. I want to be a soul winner. Lester Roloff was a soul winner. I want to be a soul winner. Dr. Hiles was a soul winner. I want to be a soul winner. Oliver B. Green was a soul winner. I want to be a soul winner. Peter was a soul winner. I want to be a soul winner. Paul was a soul winner. I want to be a soul winner. Stephen was a soul winner. I want to be a soul winner. But better than all of that, this will most make a Baptist shout on Thursday night, Jesus was a soul winner. I can't walk on water like Jesus. I can't open blind eyes like Jesus. I can't raise the dead. I'm trying my best. I can't raise the dead like Jesus, but I found out that I can win sinners to God just like Jesus, and if I can do anything like my Savior, then I want to give it all I've got and do it to the glory of God. Not everybody can sing. Not everybody can preach. Not everybody can draw. Not everybody can play the fiddle. Oh, I'm trying my best. It's, it's killing my wife. Not everybody can play an instrument, but everybody can tell somebody about what Jesus did for them. You and I ought to be busy. How many of you know what this is? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hurry. But how many, what is this? Say it. No, it's a fishing lure. Now, I'm going to give you some hollerology, some hillbilly theology this evening. I'm not living in Kentucky that long. It's still in me. You got to pray for me. This is a fishing lure. 
Now, if you and I were to go fishing and you stood up at the lake or the stream and you had a night crawler in your shirt pocket or a spinner in your purse, I'm not fishing with you. You say, why? Because either you're off your medication or you're dumb on purpose and I don't want to fish with you. Because worms don't go in your pocket and spinners don't go in your purse. They go in the lake. Did you know that a gospel track in a pocket never did win a sinner? Just like a worm in a pocket never did catch a fish. You say, well, I've never won anybody. Lord, that's because you're not casting out any bait. The best, juiciest night crawler, you ladies with me? I mean, the juiciest one, ladies. The biggest worm out there. I mean, it's not going to catch a fish until you let it get out of your pocket. You say, Brother Cooper, I'd be a sewer, but I'm too bashful to talk to folks. You don't even have to talk to them. Hand them one of these things and run. <laughs> All you have to do to be a sewer is this. Everybody do this. Yeah, it looks, looks natural. Very well, very good. Uh, stop. That's all you have to do. If you can do that, you can be a soul winner. Hand them a gospel. When you walk down the aisle at Walmart, just take a gospel track and stick it in the cereal aisle. Lay it there on the cash register. Hand it to somebody. When you walk down the aisle at your mall and just say, I want to invite you to turn. The gospel's in there. Be a soul winner. We say tomorrow, but God says go today. We say, God, when I get time, listen, quit using your excuses and just go. You say, Brother Cooper, I'm too bashful. Well, then suck your thumb and be a soul winner. You say, Brother Cooper, I'd like to go soul winner, but I've got these allergies. Well, sneeze all over them and get them to Jesus in the process. You say, Brother Cooper, I'd like to be a soul winner, but it's too cold. You're going to sweat to death in the summer. You say, well, I'd go in the summertime, but it's too hot. Well, you're going to freeze to death as you wait to winter. You say, Brother Cooper, I'd like to go soul winner, but I can't find anybody to go. I found the Holy Ghost is a pretty good partner. It's time to be a soul winner. It still works. My wife called me the other day. I was in a, I was in a meeting, and my wife called me from, from Lexington. She went out with some ladies, I guess, on Thursday night, and they knocked on a door, and a lady answered it. And the best thing about this is, well, she got saved. That's pretty good. But the best thing about it is she works at Cracker Barrel, and I'm hoping to cash in on that investment. But anyway, my, my wife said they knocked on this lady's door and talked to a lady for a while, and it was just a few uh, minutes before she bowed her head and accepted Christ as her Savior. Don't swallow the lie of the devil. It still works. Some of you young folks, you have lost folks, lost kids in your classroom that you could win to the Lord. You got lost folks, maybe even with you this week, that you could witness to and win to the Lord. You got to make it a point, get a gospel track in your purse, put one in your pocket, and then pass it out before the week's over with. God saved you, number one, to fight. Number two, God saved you to fish. And thirdly and finally, and we'll be through, God saved you to fellowship with Him. James 2.23. The Bible says, The Scripture was fulfilled which saved Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of of God. Here James is providing proof for you and I that the faith that will get us to heaven is also the faith that will put us to work. I got problems with lazy Christians. You wonder what they got. Well, you can edit that out. I nobody else liked it, but I, it, I, I, think, I, think, I think a salvation that will take you to heaven will, will that take you to the harvest field as well. The fruit of genuine fellowship with God or genuine, uh, genuine faith in God and relationship with God is fellowship or friendship with God. The Bible is very intimate. It does not say that Abraham was God's child, though he was, or God's serpent, though he was, but it gets deeper than that. It says Abraham was God's friend. The cross of Christ is more than a dragnet to pull you out of a lake of fire. It's also a divine cattle prod that thought it ought to push you closer to your Savior. I think as Dr. Howell said that God did not primarily create man to give him heaven, though that's a reason. He didn't just create man to bless him and give him joy, though that's another reason. He said primarily he created man for himself, that he might fellowship with him and walk with him and know him. It's an amazing thing to me that the God of heaven would want to have a relationship with me. God created Adam in the Garden of Eden to walk with him. He had a man named Enoch, B.R. Lakin used to say, he said, Enoch, come spend the day at my house, and it hadn't been night yet, so he never came home for fellowship. He had a man named Moses, spoke to God like a friend. David, a man after his own heart, for fellowship. But God created you on purpose. He formed you just how He wanted you. He made you just how He, how he wanted. And He wanted to be your friend. We sing the song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. But my question is, what kind of friend does Jesus have in us? We call Him the Creator. He just wants to call you friend. We call Him the Almighty God. He just wants to call you His friend. We call Him the One who's omnipotent, all-powerful. He just wants to call you my friend. The Apostle Paul said that I might know him. He said, I really don't care who's on the pop charts or who's winning uh, the playoffs right now, but I tell you what I'd like to know. I'd like to know a little bit more about my Jesus. I tell you, that's what I'd like to know too. I want to fall more in love with my God. I want to walk with him, and I want to know him more intimately as the days go by. I want to spend time in his presence. You can tell when a preacher is a friend of God or he's not. You can tell when a soul is a friend of God or not. You can tell when a young folk is, uh, is a friend of God or not. And you and I ought to strive to be close to our God. Have you read his word today? Have you prayed today? Have you consulted him about what he'd like to be dressed up in today? Are you a friend of God? 
Dr. Rice was praying, John R. Rice. He said, I don't know some of these old names you're mentioning. Well, look them up. You need to know them. Dr. Rice was praying and he said, God, I pray that you'd use me. And Jesus, I pray for your presence and Holy Spirit, I pray for your power. And a young preacher heard him pray. Dr. Tom Malone used to say young preachers like a wasp. They're always biggest right after they're hatched. And he went over to Dr. Rice and said, I heard you pray and you prayed incorrectly. I want to help you. It was theologically incorrect. And Dr. Rice said, well, go ahead. What, what's your advice? He said, well, you pray to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. He said, but the Bible says to pray to the Father through the Son in the power of the Holy Ghost. Dr. Rice says, well, that sounds pretty good. But if you knew them as well as I did, you'd pray to whichever one showed up to the table first. That's the way I want to know God. I remember when I first got saved, how real God was in my life. I got saved. I, my wife will be out there selling books afterwards and things for the college and... Uh, you can meet her out there. But I remember my wife and I met one summer. I was working at a, a summer camp clearing brush, running a weed eater and things like that. And she came out there and she took one look at this and she said, I just have to have that. And uh, so uh, after a few months of, of begging and things, I succumbed. And uh, I went I went, uh, I went to uh, to church with her. She she was raised in an independent, fundamental, premillennial, temperamental Baptist home, so she didn't go on dates. But uh, But anyway, so, but I could go to church with her. So I went to church. Now, I was raised in an American Baptist church. It was a little looser. And uh, I thought, well, I can handle that. So I went to church with her. She went out to one of these old country independent Baptist churches. I mean, a blessed God Baptist church. That's where she's at. I walked in that church, and uh, I'd never seen anything like it. All the ladies had on dresses. All the men had on ties and suits and cowboy boots, too. I didn't know that was allowed. Uh, I mean, they were, they were a sight. They played acoustic guitar and sang the old hymns, and I thought, this is different. Then the preacher got up to preach. I mean, he got up to preach, and I thought he was mad at somebody. It looked like he was off his medication and happy about it. I mean, he got up there, and he just started preaching. I mean, he preached till his spleen was bleeding, his gallbladder was in the baptistry. He had veins like anacondas running down both sides of his neck and one like a PVC pipe right between his eyes. I remember he was up there spitting on the first five rows. We used to sit in the spit section and get the showers, the blessings. He was preaching. I thought I looked over at my wife and he said, Bless God, get out your 1611 King James Bible. And I took my little Bible. I had a little Schofield Bible I borrowed from my mom. And I measured that thing up the spine as eight inches. I measured across the bottom. It's seven inches. I looked at my wife and said, He said a 16 by 11 Bible. I said, Good grief. This is, a, this is an eight by seven. She looked at me and said, Shut up. He said, take your 1611 King James. I thought he meant the size. He said, take your 1611 King James Bible. He said, and turn to the book of 1 John. I turned to John chapter 1. He started reading the book of 1 John. I read John chapter 1. I thought, this is not a 16 by 11 King James Bible. I remember he started preaching. I thought, my goodness, he's going to lock the back doors. He's going to have us drink the Kool-Aid. They're going to beam us up, Scotty. I said, I'll never be able to kiss my mom again. I'll never be able to pet my dog again. I'll never be able to, uh, to beat up my little brother again. I said, I'm going to die in this crazy kook of a cult church out here. But i never forget, he preached his message and gave an invitation. He said, but God committed his love toward Justin, and that why are yet sinners, Christ died for us. Or at least that's what I heard. And God convicted me of my sin for the very first time. I wish I'd have walked in out and got saved. I wish I would have, but I didn't. My father-in-law could tell I was under conviction. He came to me afterwards and gave me a pamphlet that was written by Dr. John R. Rice with two bloody hands on it. And I took it back to my secular college apartment and read it with that King James Bible my mom let me borrow. And I followed it along in there and got the gospel and bowed down there in my apartment and asked Jesus to save me, and he did. No preacher ever told me to quit listening to anything, but I wanted to quit and listen to what God wanted me to listen to. Nobody ever told me to change my wardrobe, but I wanted to. I just wanted to be close to God. Yeah. Nobody told me to find better friends or seek a different crowd, but I wanted to. I remember I'd drive two hours back from that secular college just to go to church on Wednesday nights and Sundays. And my wife was at a Bible college. She wasn't even home, and I'd still go to church. That's how I know I got the real thing. I was going to church even when the hot girl wasn't there. <laughs> I'd drive two hours back to go to church. They'd have ladies' Bible study, and I'd show up. And they'd say, what are you doing here? i said, I just like it. They'd ask if anybody, they'd say, anybody, anybody got a testimony? And I never did, but I always had one. Y'all know people like that. And I'd stand up and I'd love her for 20 minutes. And they all thought, I hope Brother Cooper doesn't have a testimony. <laughs> Everything, I just, I couldn't help it. I, I remember driving back to college on Saturdays. I'd listen to the Fundamental Broadcasting Network. Now I have a radio broadcast on the radio station. 2.30 in the afternoon, Maze Jackson come on with a truck driver special. And I'd listen to that and he'd say, this is Brother Maze. You know, it sounded like he'd been gargling acid. And I thought, I like this. Billy Kelly would come on there and he'd be singing, We're nearing the shore. Or Curtis Hudson would come on and he'd be singing, Well, I'm on the winning side. Yes, I'm on the winning. I thought, Man, I like this. All the big green come on. Sound like, sound like he'd been chewing on roofing nails and had gunpowder sprinkled on his frosted flakes for breakfast. I thought, Man, I want to sound like that when I preach someday. 
Lester Roloff come on there. He started preaching against coffee and deodorant. I thought, I don't know if I like this guy. <laughs> I, couldn't have, I couldn't get enough of it. I took all the old CDs I used to listen to in Frisbee to mount the window. God was so real in my life. I think at that point in my life, just freshly saved, I could say without a doubt, I was the friend of God. But you know what I found out? As I go on, I've got to keep myself close to Him. I've got to make myself stay near Him. The real theme song of revival is not necessarily revival us again. I think it's near my God to thee. I want to ask you now, are you the friend of God? That's why He saved you. I'm glad I'm not a verse 9 and 10 sinner. I'm glad I'm in verse 11 and such were some of you. Fight, fish, fellowship. 